I'm Melissa Chan. Thanks for joining us both in person and online. We are in conversation with journalist John Allen Namu, co-founder of Africa Uncensored, a Kenya-based investigative newsroom. Welcome, John. Thank you very much, Melissa. I'm glad to be here. Well, unfortunately, I understand you were supposed to be here in person, and because of the visa issues that RightsCon has addressed, um, it is deeply unfortunate. Here's another example of uh, a moment where we could have been sitting opposite each other, so I apologize on behalf mm -hmm. of everybody here. No worries. I guess um, the wonders of technology will allow us to still have this conversation here, yeah, but it would have been nice to be um, there with you in Costa Rica. Absolutely. Now, just some quick housekeeping for everyone. Um, please do ask questions, post your questions, and um, do it through the Slido platform. Uh, if you're both in person and online, that is the way that we'll be doing it. And I will just ask questions as they come up. There's no question and answer section at the back. So I'll try to integrate as much of audience feedback as possible. I just want to uh, introduce John Allen a little bit more. You were CNN African Journalist of the Year. You've produced a number of investigative documentaries, including one with the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists from the uh, Pandora Papers fame on secret companies by the family of the then Kenyan president. You've also investigated how members of South Sudan's elites have profited from war and stolen money from the country. And there are so many other documentaries on kidnapping, torture, and murder uh, of human rights lawyer Willie Kamani, along with um, uh, Joseph Mururi and Joseph Mwenda. So for your work, you have also, as a result, received a lot of death threats. You've also invested in the future of journalism, and your newsroom has trained and mentored some 700 young journalists over the years. So all very fascinating, and I hope to uh, cover all of this. Um, but uh, just to start, could you just introduce Africa Uncensored a bit more? Maybe tell us about one of the stories that uh, you have been working on and uh, the impact of that. All right, so um, Africa Uncensored is an investigative and in-depth journalism media company based in Nairobi. Uh, we started because we felt that there was little room um, in our newsroom because we all worked, um, me and my co-founders worked in a private newsroom in Nairobi. We felt that it was, um, you know, reducing space, reducing amount of space for us to be able to tell the kind of story that we wanted to. And we struck out on our own in 20, late 2015. Since then, we've uh, done, as you had mentioned, a number of documentaries that with a, a small but really energetic and talented team here. Um, we've done a lot of stuff from follow the money um, investigations to human rights um, abuse um, investigation. And, and um, we, we, in 2019, launched a, a website that did fact-checking or does fact-checking. Um, on a daily basis, which is our response to the infodemic across the world and especially here in Africa and in Kenya. So um, the work that we're doing right now is really focused um, for this year. Our three themes are death, climate change, and corruption, um, all of which are very urgent um, subjects. Um, you, you know, of course, about the cost of living crisis, and all of these have um, some sort of um, impact on the cost of living crisis, if not uh, being partially the cause of them. So I'm personally working on uh, one or two documentaries on the same. Um, I've, I've got team members who are working on land corruption issues at the moment uh, to be released uh, later on this year. And we've got a couple of um, in-depth investigative work that, that's going to be launched um, again later on this year with respect to um, organized crime in the country and, and beyond. You, ex you said you, that you expressed frustration just now um, working in a more traditional newsroom. Why, what's keeping some newsrooms from doing the kind of work that you're now doing? Was it a money issue? Was it a lack of innovation? Talk a little bit about that. I think it's both, right? Um, so uh, in 2010, 2010 was one of the, the best years for journalism in, in our country. Profits were good. Um, you know, people are getting bonuses. Um, there was lots of attention on traditional media, and there was no incentive to change. There was no incentive to innovate. But um, at that same time around the world, media companies were, you know, experiencing downturns in terms of profit, 
um, closures even uh, because of the advent of the internet and the impact of advertising. Um, you know, the, the, the impact of advertising online and what that had to the traditional advertising needs. Um, and that was going to come to Kenya um, much, much sooner than we had expected. So um, there was, in the early days, I think, a failure to appreciate just how important and how impactful that, that shift um, had been. And we started to see this. Um, the, the second thing, I think, was just restrictions in terms of um, the space that we had to be able to tell stories. There was a lot of editorializing um, in the past 10 years. Um, of our content um, when we were in the newsroom, there was, uh, I'd say, almost pedantic, you know, editorializing of our content. I'm, I'm one for, you know, editorial input that improves the work that you do, but not one that seems to nitpick um, so that the entire purpose of a story is lost. Um, so those were the two main reasons. But I mean, beyond that, you also, we also had our own uh, personal ambition. Um, of what the world, according to us, would look like with our own stamp or, or our own spin on, on um, investigative journalism, and what that would look like for Africa. So for us, it was important not just, you know, to be able to um, uh, to be able to do our own work, but also to have some sort of legacy that we'd leave um, after having left this profession, that we um, were able to strike out on our own, we were able to um, um, impact the lives of the many people that we report about, but more importantly, we're also able to build the field with new talent, um, young talent, and people who are, have innovative and fresh ideas. And that's my hope. My hope is that if, if everything else fails, at least Africa and Center introduce to the world a lot of new talent um, from Kenya and, and from around Africa. It's been a tremendous number of young journalists that the newsroom has trained. Can you talk about how that happened? Uh, you talk about money. Money is important for absolutely everything, including running a newsroom. How do you make this new business model work in a very scary world where even in the richest countries, newsrooms are shutting down because they can't sustain their business model? What is the new model? What is working for you? Well, Melissa, that's a tough question because I, I don't think that we've cracked it yet. I, I don't think that we, we've got it 100%. Um, our model is, is, is a blended model between, um, you know, partner, um, partner um, grants as well as commercial, um, you know, uh, commercial revenues that we get from um, commission documentaries, productions that we do um, over and above the work that we do. We, we haven't um, started advertising. Um, and so that blend seems to have worked at least in part, but we, we all, we also have funding gaps at times that, many times that I've spent sleepless nights, you know, thinking about payroll, thinking about how to be able to manage the next cycle of um, storytelling when one grant ends and, and I don't have, you know, some money in between. So, I mean, there's, there's no real answer as to how this works. Um, here or anywhere else in the world. I think we're all just trying our hand at what works best, best and what fits um, best with our, our local environment. Certainly, there's been a, a growing appetite for uh, digital content in Kenya, um, as well as, you know, across Africa. Whether that translates into money um, at some point down the road, we're going to see, you know, like real money that can sustain usual. But we have to think about lots of things, lots of different, um, you know, pathways to be able to do that. And training initially was, you know, we, we thought of training as, as, as I mentioned, a legacy issue that we'd be able to build a field. But increasingly, that, that's also becoming something that because we've done it over a number of years, we've become fairly competent at and now a number of people are asking us to train um, and help um, with um, solidifying their newsroom um, in terms of investigative reporting. That brings in you know, a revenue stream and we're thankful for it. But there's no one way um, to be able to do this. And, and I guess the, the, the deeper we go into this, the more we discover. Hopefully, you know, sometime soon we can we can crack something that we can then now present to the world and say, hey, here's how we did it. But we're still on that journey, Melissa. Okay, let's turn to the editorial after we've talked about the business. Um, tell us a little bit about the work that um, you've done on the crime front and also to what extent technology has helped as a tool to help reporters uh, achieve some of these investigations. 
Well, certainly. I mean, we've done a lot of work um, in terms of crime. As I mentioned, we've done um, lots of stuff on human rights abuses. You mentioned the Widi Kimani documentary, which for us was was really important, given that we, we started covering it from the moment that um, those murders took place. Um, we've covered, um, uh, you know, crimes in, uh, across across borders with um, South Sudan, uh, um, relating to money laundering, illicit financial flows. Um, I think the most important work that we've done um, over the past seven years has been related to procurement fraud in Kenya, which is, you know, it accounts for the loss of almost, you know, 70 to 80 percent by uh, various estimates of um, the budget that we raise through tax. That's a, a really urgent issue right now, given that we are in very, very bad straits when it comes to debt. When it comes to technology, I mean, it's been very, very helpful in at least for us, establishing certain things that we wouldn't have been able to see, um, you know, without without its aid. What I mean by this is making connections, for instance, um, with that procurement work that we've done um, between companies that seem disparate and disconnected from the entire chain of corruption and procurement fraud um, to, you know, central figures who um, are manipulating, are marionetting the system to, to ensure that they profit from it. Um, so, you know, basic tools that, that rely on, on machine learning and AI to be able to develop really nice, complex network structures, for instance, um, have been helpful for us um, in terms of also presenting our data. Um, we've we've uh, partnered with um, a local really, really um, innovative company here to, to present, um, you know, corruption statistics across 50 years um, in, a, in a website that we call WYSIWYG. Um, Wizi is um, Swahili for for uh, theft, so not to be confused with WikiLeaks. Um, but but it was you know kind of an honor that we had that similar you know sounding name, um, and that that's really been helpful in helping audiences understand what the impact of the things that we report about on a daily basis are across space and time. I think that I think the important thing about um, technology. It can help you deepen your content as well as simplify it and explain things at a systemic level, but also at a Oh, John Allen, I think I just um, lost your audio there. And it sounds like you have- Yeah, can you hear me now? Ah, I can. I can. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. No worries, no worries. Um, just to follow up on that, um, I think it's very interesting because we're in a time when so many newsrooms around the world are in financial peril, and yet some, I think, so everyone is talking about the death of journalism and so on and so forth, but it, it also feels like some of the best investigative reporting I've ever seen around the world is happening right now. You're doing some of that, and some of it is because of the ability for newsrooms to collaborate transnationally in a way that they didn't 20, 30 years ago. Can you talk a little bit about where you've had that kind of collaboration or what kind of stories? I mean, I'm collaborating right now with a newsroom in, in the United Kingdom for a story that I'm doing um, with regard to Kenya's debt situation. And we've done so, you know, for a number of years. Collaboration has been, I think, the secret source in how um, journalists across the world and newsrooms across the world have been able to really build you know, very, very strong investigative work. Look at the, the Lava Jato um, um, investigations from uh, from South America, Brazil, you know, Peru, etc. Those kind of transnational investigations would not have happened were it not for, you know, collaborative efforts between journalists in that part of the world. Um, I was part of the biggest, you know, collaboration of journalists ever in history um, under the Pandora Papers and got to investigate um, you know, very interesting and important information about the former first family. These things over, especially over the life of African censored, has been so important in really broadening the scope of the journalism that we do. And I think, you know, going forward, where money can't quite, you know, get us where we want to go, that kind of collaborative work is what's going to be able to get you know journalism farther and deeper into and into places that we might not even have imagined. I think it's really a significant shift in how we do things, and a recognition that you know the scoop um, is 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 what's dying or on its deathbed in journalism, right? Because you know you you can't you you can't 
publish faster than Twitter. You can't publish faster than someone with a smartphone on the ground. But you can give meaning. You can give context. You can help people understand what the world is like. And sometimes that means reaching across borders, reaching across continents. And that kind of collaborative effort, I think, is something that should be encouraged now and into the future. We do have one question from someone. Um, they are asking, what are some of the hopes and worries among the young journalists you have trained? Well, the hope is that, of course, they're, they're able to make us, you know, solid careers out of journalism. The fear, again, is related to cash, the same thing, you know. They see um, what's happening in the industry and how it's eviscerated, you know, revenues, how it's, it's um, you know, led to the loss of hundreds of jobs, um, especially in the past three years with COVID. So there's a lot of fear around job security. There's a lot of fear about whether they'll be able to make it. But there's also a lot of hope for the very same reason that you know you had mentioned that there's there's now an ability to report about you know things and events and circumstances that are far and away you know would have been out of your reach maybe even five or six years ago. Um, I think the younger generation of journalists are more keen also to make those kinds of connections and use the tools that they have at their disposal, TikTok and what have you. Um, to to make a name for themselves, which which I think is really cool, and I think it it it, it therein lies also part of the future in journalism. That that in 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 these young journalists, there's a, a sense of I, I don't know whether I lost it or or um, or you know getting older makes you lose that sense of was bravery bravery that that's that's bordering on being cavalier, but it's it's exciting to see young people that still have that kind of energy. Um, and, and that's what excites me most. The fears I think all of us, you know, share, but but the hopes really lie and rest with them and their aggressiveness in, in how they want to look at the world and their worldview especially. I think it's really interesting what you said earlier about how the scoop is dying, and that actually means that a long-form journalism, investigative journalism is kind of where the action is at. On the other hand, um, the content might be there, but what about the content readers, as in the public? Uh, they are on TikTok looking at things for 15 seconds. You're doing incredible investigations that last two years. Um, how do you make sure that your work gets communicated to the citizens who need to absolutely know about the corruption, the crime, and so on? Humble pie, um, in two words, um, making sure that <laughs> Um, in as much as we love our long form stories, we, we pay attention to what the audience actually wants and how they want it delivered. I think um, there, was a, there was a digital news report that was published by Reuters um, and, and you know they said that it's not so much about the fact that young people aren't interested in news. I think it's formats and, and how you know um, news is presented that needs to change, it needs to adapt to them. I, I was at a, a conference um, not too long ago in, in Vienna where the same kinds of principles were being discussed and people are experimenting with that. So again, you know, news and, and journalism generally has been a very innovative sector. I think that once we kind of swallow our pride and, and stop living in the in you know in the past a little bit we will find that way forward but I, again i also think that there's space for what we do um you know the, the audience these days is an audience of one so you you will find that community of people who still appreciate in-depth long-form documentaries and will still do that but we still have to find ways to deliver the same kind of content to younger audiences people who might not have the time or who want a summary of the same um, and, you know, if we're not going to do it, then artificial intelligence will for them and, and, you know, put it in a summary of a newsletter. And, you know, our work will have been done for us by, you know, um, a machine, essentially. Uh, so why not try and learn how to do it ourselves so that we can work with AI to, to ensure that we're, we're really delivering for our audiences? Great. And a question has come in, which is uh, related about... Uh communicating the news, what advice would you give to activists and communities trying to have their stories told and raise attention to issues they face that often get ignored by international media? Wow, that's a tough one. Um, but I I think the principle lies in in the storytelling, not, not so much the issue 
issues are important. There's many things that we need to pay attention to. I think that the secret lies in the storytelling. I think that, you know, um, activists, people in civil society, people even in business need to start, you know, learning how to tell their own stories and the stories of, of the people that they affect, the lives that are impacted by these issues in a more succinct and more relatable and personal way. Um, there was a training that I attended years ago, and, 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 I, and I stole this phrase from, from our trainer, and he, he was like, the closer you get to people, the closer you get to a story. And I say that all the time with all of the trainings that I'm, I'm engaged with or leading, because it's actually true. You know, stories are about people. And the more we relate these kinds of big issues, these systemic issues to the lives of people in, in a very real way, then those kinds of stories are able to thread the needle between you know lots of content online and other important issues that that people pay attention to and get to the audiences that that um, you know they are required to 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 be seen by great i want to then bring back to uh the conversation on misinformation and disinformation you've had a, quite a number of projects to combat that do you feel with AI and also with the fact that social media regulation and that discussion has been going on for a number of years and we've seen very little action, uh, that it's, we're starting to lose that fight? John Allen, could you hear me? I'm, oh, there I'm on the fence of, about this one because, yeah, yeah I, I can tell you now. Yeah, sorry, my, my internet's what yet. I don't know why. Um, I'm on the fence about this um, because, first of all, I think we're, we're too early in the AI journey to really establish as to whether it'll, it'll, it'll be an effective tool for fact checking. We, we, we certainly know that it has a power to be, you know, very, very responsive, um, intuitive. But um, is it... Is it better, you know, is it going to be able to, to pass through facts where the truth is actually in the context and not in the content? Um, there's, there's, there's really a lot to learn and a lot more that needs to happen with AI before it becomes a kind of tool that we can depend on um, to become that, that adjudicator in a, in, a, in a trustless world. I think what we, what we need to be thinking about now is A, uses and B, limits, right? So how... Um, what are the, what are the uses that we can apply um, in AI for journalism now that can help us, you know, maybe speed up our, our work and help us become a bit more judicious about the kinds of sources that we choose, um, without the AI doing, you know, artificial intelligence um, doing the work for us in total. Um, and then, you know, the the, the, the second question, which is um, around legislation, right? So. It's it's a big question and a, and a tough question, um, and there's lots of views about it. I, I think, again, um, we've we've legislated against harm retrospectively um, in the past, especially when it comes to the internet. I think there's an opportunity now with um, the conversation about artificial intelligence to really think as broadly as possible as to what the broad, you know. Um, framework for, for legislation of AI will be. It's moving so fast that be, before the ink dries on any law that you write about it, things will have moved beyond it. So I think it's really about frameworks and, and, and principles that we need to be able to lay down first and start to in, you know, intuit a, a little bit about the laws that we have. And, and I think it's forcing an important question on, um, you know, the global, the global civilization. Mm. What happens when technology moves faster than our laws and our, and our, you know, our, uh, our, uh, our systems? Do? What happens then? How do you, how do you match that speed? Do you switch off the machines, or do you figure out how to be able to walk and chew gum? You know, and, and that, that I think is a question that's being forced on us, Could as you, you know, as the world. Could you talk about it in the context of Kenya and what the government is talking about on digital legislation, cyber legislation, and are you concerned about any of the clauses being proposed? My concern is that we are copycatting a little too much. We're not working from our own first principles. We're not thinking about the context that we're in in Africa, in Kenya, 
and legislating around that. So, you know, we'll, we'll be looking at GDPR as the standard, right? And whereas it has, you know, whereas it has some very interesting principles or, you know, new, new legislation or new thoughts around AI being developed elsewhere, we're not really thinking about what, you know, AI actually means for us, whether there are certain embedded structural problems with the development of artificial intelligence now that might impact you know people from my my country and my part of the world differently than they would and and that goes to you know who is who is training these machines who is training um you, you know who is training the algorithms and how do they learn that i think for me is is more the important discussion than the letter of the law per se because when you start to think about what this actually means for you, then you'd be, you're better armed to educate yourself and um, uh, legislators as well as to what the impact could be for us. It could be completely different and come vastly more impactful for us in a positive way than you know has been perceived. Or, but we'll never know if we continue to just take the lead of other places in the world who, while they might be leaders in development of the tools, you know, are necessarily familiar with what our context is. And it has to be that context uh, specific if we're going to be able to get the very best out of artificial intelligence. Last question, because of the dangerous work that your newsroom does, and of course, RightsCon is all about technology, what parameters or what safety measures do you take to protect journalists against digital surveillance? Well, um, with with our team, we we do a number of things. I mean, the, the basics, of course, um, are with protecting your devices and and protecting the, the 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 sanctity of your information, where you store it, how you keep it, um, um, who has access to it. So those are the basics in our organization. Um, the second um, thing would be, you know, figuring out what digital harms, harm means also from a mental health perspective. You know, um, that, that could be impacts that we're not thinking about that, you know, to people's um, own mental health, et cetera, that emanate from, from um, the kinds of digital threats that they face. And so there, there's, there's been quite a bit of attention that's paid to, you know, mental health and, and their well-being for our, our staff. Um, I think the third thing is is just trying to pass through what the real world impacts could be um, from you know the kind of digital um, safety threats that that might emerge, right? So if there's a phishing, um, you know, if there's a phishing uh, attempt on on our information, etc., what could the attempts be uh, be driven by or motivated by? Who could be behind that? So spending a bit of time thinking about that. And building into, especially with the sensitive stories that we do, you know, just planning for risks that we might not be able to see. That's not very easy to do, but it's important to think through at, at the very least, you know, what sort of digital risks might I face, what sort of physical risks might I face, and where do the two meet? Um, so with, with our journalists, we, we try as much as possible to plan um, quite far ahead um, when we've got a project that's important to us. Um, it doesn't always work. It, 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 it's not foolproof. And as you know, with the evolving um, digital space, nothing really is foolproof. But those kinds of things have helped mitigate quite a lot of risk for us. Melissa. John Allen Namu, it has been a pleasure and an honor to speak to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Melissa. And that's it for now. Stay engaged as always.